Alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah Alhamdulillah nahmaduhu wa nasta'inuhu wa nastaghfiruh wa na'udhu billahi min shururi anfusina wa min sayyi'ati a'malina man yahdihillahu fala mudilla lahu wa man yudlil fala hadiya lahu wa nashhadu an la ilaha illa Allah wahdahu la sharika lahu wa nashhadu anna Muhammadan 'abduhu wa rasuluhu wa nabiyyuhu wa khalilu Allahumma salli wa sallim wa barik ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala khulafa'ihi ar-rashidin Abu Bakr wa Umar wa Uthman wa Ali wa ashabihi al-mayamin وأمهات المؤمنين ومنا معهم يا أرحم الراحمين أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Last time we started the seerah of Rasulullah صلى الله عليه وسلم and as we mentioned that we started from the time of our father Ibrahim عليه وعلى نبينا محمد أفضل الصلاة والتسليم and all of us acknowledge Ibrahim and Ismail in building uh, the Kaaba, Sharafah Allah, and most of the rituals that we do today, we have seen last week, comes from the time of Ibrahim. Zamzam, Tawaf, Sa'i, Safa al Marwa, um, as well Rajm, Shaitan, Al Jamarat. These are all rituals of Ismail and Ibrahim and Hajar alayhi wa ala nabiya, Muhammad Abdul Salat wa Taslim. And through them, Tawheed spread in Arabia. So all of Arabia, basically were embracing Islam until a man by the name of Amr ibn Luhay ibn Khuza'a came and started to introduce for the first time idols. And with that, shirk started in Arabia, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned in many surah of the Quran. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam fil Bukhari mentioned Amr ibn al-Hay alayhi min Allah ma yasdahiq and the fact that he is the first one to change the religion of Ibrahim and Ismail alayhi wa ala nabina Muhammad afdal salati wa taslim and we started to see idols in every and each tribe in Arabia and of course around Mecca, Kaaba, sharafah Allah the arrival of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam some of the scholars said 360 idols. We're not counting here the little idols that are made for each home. So each home will have their own idols. And before you leave, you will stand in your home and you start to ask blessing from them. Uh, and basically you will go in your way. As well, we started to see the change of Talbiyah. لَبَّيْكَ اللَّهُمَّ لَبَّيْكَ He introduced talbiyat al-shirk. إِلَّا شَرِيكًا هُوَ لَكْ تَمْلُكُهُ وَمَا مَلَكَ And this actually changed again when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came with his message. Salawatu Rabbi wa salamuhu alayhi. Started to introduce what we call um, the sacred animals. عَلَيْهِ مِنَ اللَّهِ مَا يَسْتَحِقْ And of course the religion of Ibrahim started to basically fade away. Scholars died, shirk became the norm, and with that as well, we started to see a different social life in Arabia. And we touched on uh, women, and we said that they used to kill their own daughter. They used to bury them alive, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, said in the Quran in Surah Al-Takweer what type of people that will take his own child bury her alive and have no heart or feelings and with that as well the social life started to take totally different turn the killing started and of course, zina, or Billah, started a killing of each other as well, and everything in between. Part of the oppression that happened to women as well, that if the father died, the son will take all the wives of his father except his mother, and as well, the issue of marriage, as our mother Aisha Umm al told us 
the types of marriage in Arabia. So al-fahisha was zina, uh, was all around in Arabia, not just in Mecca, Mecca, Taif, Yathrib, all around. And that is uh, something that we need to understand the challenge for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa when he comes, all these idols, he had to convince his people to go back to the deen of Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam. And the character to be able to do and wipe out hundreds of years of idol worshippers to say la ilaha illallah, this is basically the seerah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa The second, the social aspect of Arabia that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa has to get involved with, has to change. We know with the economy, we had slave structures. We had class structure. It's not abnormal in the world during that time. If we look at the Persians, if we look at the Indian, the Chinese, the African, and the Romans, they have a class system. Well structured class system. Majority are slaves. Arabia was exactly the same. You can go shopping and you can buy whatever you want. A boy, a girl, a woman, men, and this man has to change this. Actually, the names that we know of and we love most, slaves, the likes of Bilal. Everyone knows Bilal. Anywhere around the world, he was an Abyssinian slave. Allahu Akbar. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told him, come and tell me, Fil Bukhari, how did you, I heard the footsteps of you in paradise. Bilal, Umm Ayman, a Bassinian slave, a present from Abdul Muttalib to his son Abdullah, looked after Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam all the way through. She outlived him. He loved her. And he will say, Ummi ba'da Ummi, my mother after my mother, breaking the barriers. You can't do it without you be the example. And when she married Zayd ibn Haritha, another slave, they used to call Zayd Hibb al Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And his son, Usama ibn Zayd, Hibb, Hibb al Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. What do you expect the companions will do to their slaves? The way the used women, abused woman, he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had to put an end to it. Even dealing with animals, overburdening them, he had to deal with them. So he had a major 23 years of his life sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that's true, 23 only, to change Arabia, but it's not only Arabia. Because everything that he will do, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, will affect the whole world. Because his companions will take the message beyond. And everywhere they will go, they will be welcomed. This is what we do, and this is what you're giving us. And you are the so-called occupiers. How sweet Islam is. And they embraced Islam. So no force could stop it. They gamble, they drink. Political life was very difficult because there is no instability in the land. The tribes will kill each other. They will fight each other all the time. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, before he died, he united all of Arabia. Medina was the head, and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is the ruler, Allahu Akbar. Where can I find this man? You will enter the masjid, and you will never recognize him, because he, doesn't, he didn't have slaves next to him. Big seat, he was just a normal person. And this is exactly what happened to Abu Bakr and Umar and Osman and Ali radiallahu anhum wa ardahum ajma'in. His students and many other companions 
in their day-to-day -day life. Radiallahu anhum wa radahum ajma'in. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when he came, there were Judaism in Arabia. The Jews came to Arabia after two major massacres that took place against them. One by the Persian king, Bahta Nasr. And the Persians used to fight with the Romans all the time. Bahta Nasr made his impact and he went all the way to Bilad al-Sham and he went to Palestine and took thousands of Jews as slaves back to Persia. He's still, still in Iran till today. So many of them migrated to Arabia. The second massacre happens during the Roman governor by the name of Bats. He hated them. And he killed thousands of them. He actually went and destroyed Bayt al-Maqdis. And many of the Jews left to Arabia. So when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam received the message, there were Jews in Khaybar, north of Medina. There were Jews in Medina itself, Yasrib, Bani Qaynuqa'a, Bani Quraiza, or Bani Nudir. And the three of them, Allah talked to us about them in the Quran. And many ahadith, insha'Allah, when we go to Medina, Allah, we'll go into more details. The Jews as well went to Yemen. How did that happen? How did they go to Yemen? There is actually the story of how Judaism came to Yemen. This came through a dream of one of the ruler of Yemen. And we said last week that the ruler of Yemen, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala called him in the Quran, Qawm Tubba. Tubba is the title. We will concentrate in one of them by the name of Taban Asad, who was the ruler of most of the areas of Yemen. Strong ruler, well-to-do, honorable man. In one of his trips to the north in Bilad al-Sham, he left his son in Yasrib, or Medina today, Allah, for business. And he and just went up north to Bilad al-Sham. His son in Medina, he had a problem with the people of Medina. They killed him. The father, Tabban Asad, heard about what happened to his son, and he mobilized an army and basically started to attack Medina, day and night. As we said in Medina, we had Jews. Two of their scholars went to Tabban Asad. What are you doing? He said, revenge. I will destroy those people and their city. They said to him, you can't. You will never be able to. How do you know? This is a place that a prophet will come and migrate to and Allah will protect this city. <coughs> a prophet? How do you know this? We have it in our book. What book? A Tawrah. Tell me about it. They started to talk to him about at Tawrah, and he became a Jew. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, as he said in Surah Al-A'raf, So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentioned for Tawrat wal Injil as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they know him sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But they denied his message. 
Taban Asad asked the Jews to come with him to Yemen so he, they can teach him and his people about Judaism. On the way down from Medina to Yemen, he stopped at Mecca, Sharafahallah. Before he entered Mecca, there was a tribe by the name of Huzail. They hated the Yemenites and they hated the people of Mecca. And they went to Ban Asad and they said, what do you think of a place, a house that is full of gold and jewels and precious items? He said, what is this? He said, that's actually in, in Kaaba. Those people worship it and inside, but you have to destroy it first to get all these jewels. He said, great. So he mobilized his army and he started to move in to destroy the Kaaba so he can get the jewels. The two scholars, the Jews, started to see funny movements for his army. What are you doing? I'm after the precious items in this house. They said, Wallahi, this is the only house on earth for Allah. And if you destroy it, you will be destroyed. What do I do then? They said, Adhamu, glorify it. What do I do? Make tawaf. He did. Taban Asad slept in Mecca and had a dream. In his dream, he saw that he was ordered to cover the Kaaba. Kiss what? Al Kaaba. And he did. The first one to cover the Kaaba, Tabban Asad. This is history. This is what we have in Ibn Kathir, Tabari, Ibn Al Athir, and many others. And he left. He went to Yemen propagate Judaism and the people enter into and Yemen entered and embraced Judaism. After that, an event took place not very far from Yemen for a missionary, a Christian missionary left Bilad al-Sham, going to Africa to propagate the true religion of Allah, Isa, alayhi wa ala nabina Muhammad, afdal salatu wa taslim. As he was coming down, a caravan stopped him, took him as a slave. They sold him, and he ended up in a place called Najran, north of Yemen, not very far from Yemen. Being a slave, he had to work for his master all day. In the night, he will go to his hut, worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That hut, the master started to see strange things. He saw lights. He went in and said, what, is, what, what are you doing? What, is, what are you? He said, I worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He said, who is Allah? Allah is the creator. The people of Najran, Subhanallah, shaitan alayhim and Allah ma'astahaq, they used to worship a tree. They used to worship a tree. So this man by the name of Mion said to his master, you are worshipping idol. My God is the creator, the mighty. If my God destroy your God, will you embrace my religion? He said, if that happens, yes. Fimium made dua, again, the tree destroyed, and the people of Najran went into Christianity. This is well documented. One of his students, Abdullah ibn Thamir, secretly went to Yemen. Yemen is Judaism, but now Judaism started to take a different turn, shirk. One of his students, Abdullah ibn Samir, had a place or a hut to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and propagate Islam in secrecy. Yemen at that stage was controlled by another tubba, 
by the name of Zu Nawaz. Zu Nawaz was a dictator, he was like a god. And he was depending on his rule on magician and sorcerers. The head of the magicians was very old. And he said to the king, Zu Nawaz, I need a young, bright man so I can yani, teach him. I have not too many years to live. So the king went out and his advisors and they selected a very bright young man. And he was very proud of that. That young man became the student and he was told to go to the mountain and st start to attend this session and lessons from the magician. Yes. This young man, every morning, leave the house, go to the mountain, spend the whole day with the magician, and then back. As he was going in his way, he saw a hut. And one of the followers of Abdullah ibn Samir was sitting in. So he went in quietly and he sat, listening to him. And then left him, went up the mountain, and then back. Second day, and the third day, he started to like what he's hearing from the believer. So he started to spend more time with the believer than the magician. There's a couple of the story, this hadith from Bukhari, it's a very long one, so I'm not going to go into details of it. He started to like the kahin more, and he started to hate the magician more. Anyway, one day he decided not to go up the mountain, spend the whole day with the magician, with the kahin. The magician called the king. He sent him a text message. He said, where is the boy? What happened to him? They brought the boy. What's happening? He said, nothing. Where do you go? He didn't tell them. So this basically sent behind him two of their guards, and they went to the hut, and they took the kahin to the palace. Who are you? What religion are you? And he started to tell them about the true Christianity. Of course, Zunawas was so angry. He asked him to denounce his religion. He refused. He killed him. He brought the boy and he said, that's it. Now you go back to what you've been asked to do. He said, no. He said, I'll kill you. He said, kill me. So he basically publicly now, challenging the king, he told his soldiers to take him and throw him in the river, Narit Sea. They did. Took him in a boat, in the middle of the sea, a huge wave came, took the boat upside down, the soldiers died, and the boy came out safe. The king was so angry. And the people started to get interest. It's now everywhere, Facebook. Have a look at the boy. He's actually safe, and the king is very angry with him. Can't kill him. So he ordered the soldiers now, and everybody's looking up the mountain, and throw him from right at the top. Shake happened. The soldiers died, and the boy came down, safe. Do you want to kill me? The boy said to the king. He said, yes. He said, there's only one way that you can kill me. How? He said, bring all the people and take my bow and arrow. Tie me to a tree and said, Bismillah, Rabbul Ghulam. In the name of the Lord, the Lord of the boy, and shoot, you'll kill me. He said, great, we'll do that. People came, tree, Tar the boy, he took his bow and arrow and did. Killed the boy. The boy was killed. People are looking. 
with all the power that he's got, all the soldiers that he's got, couldn't kill the boy. He only managed to kill him with the name of his Lord, the Lord of the boy. We are all believer of the Lord of the boy. 20,000 Yemenit became believer. On the spot, the king became furious. How can that happen? I killed one and I'm now getting 20,000? Are you going back? No. So he asked his soldiers to dig huge ditches, put wood in and start a huge fire. Mentioned in the Quran and mentioned in Sahih, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, one of those who are about to be thrown into the fire was a woman with her infant, baby. And she was hesitant. And the baby actually spoke. We have four children, infants spoke at that age. This is one of them. Ya umma, ilqi binafsik fa'innaki muqbilatin ala al-jannah. Throw yourself. You are heading to paradise. Hadith sahih li Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned what happened to those believers in Surat. Shahidin, Sunawas and his entourage, wa mashhud, the day. Qutila ashabul ukhdud, the people of the trenches were killed. How? Anar, the fire. Izhum alayha qu'ud, they were sitting down, it's a ticket now, we can see those Christians getting killed, the believers. And Allah acknowledged that they were believers. Izhum alayha qu'ud. وَهُمْ عَلَى مَا يَفْعَلُونَ بِالْمُؤْمِنِينَ شُهُود What was the cause of this? وَمَا نَقَمُوا مِنْهُمْ Not for uh, challenge on his seat, not for um, any dispute. The only thing that they basically massacre them. لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ وَمَا نَقَمُوا مِنْهُمْ إِلَّا أَنْ يُؤْمِنُوا بِاللَّهِ الْعَزِيزِ الْحَمِيدِ الله أكبر. 20,000. One was saved, run away. Run away all the way to the north. And he met with Caesar, the head of the Roman Empire. And he told him about the tragedy of his people and the massacre that took place in Yemen. And Caesar said, Yemen, this is too far for us. You have to go through Arabia, desert. No. But I can tell you something. I'm going to give you a letter. They used to write letters. There is no laptop or messages over the internet. I'll give you a letter and take it to the king of Abyssinia, Habasha, in Africa. He's a Christian. And I will ask him to help you and your people. He said, yes, do that. Ifal. He did. All the way to Anujashi. He was furious. How dare those Yemenit killed his own people, the believers. So he mobilized an army that Arabia will never see anything like it. 70,000 strong. They crossed from the Red Sea to Yemen. 
with a general by the name of Ariat, go and destroy this man who did what he did to the believers. And they managed to destroy him. They killed him. Ariat sent a message. Yemen is under our control and Christianity will be the religion. Ariat, after years of ruling as a governor, he became a, a little dictator, not only against the Yemenite, but against his own people. That one of his own general stood against him. What are you doing? They challenged each other. They fought each other, and that other general managed to defeat him. That general basically will have a mention in the Quran. His name was Abraha. When a Nujashi king of Habasha heard that Abraha killed his governor, he was furious. How dare you do this? Abraha, of course, sent a message saying his reasons, and a Nujashi agreed. But Abraha started to build a beautiful church, the biggest in whole of Arabia by the name of Al Qulais. The reason for it, to bring all Arabia to embrace Christianity. One of the people of Ahl Nasi, and Nasi means to delay. Ahl Nasi are a group of religious people in Arabia who used to control the forbidden months. One of the rituals of Ibrahim alayhi salam that we have four forbidden months in the year. Rajab by itself, Zul Qa'da, Zul Hijjah, and Muharram. Three after each other. Those Ahl al-Nasi can play around with the months. And the reason for that is the Arabs cannot go for three months without war, without killing. So what they used to do, they will say Zul Qa'da, Zul Hijjah, and instead of Muharram, which you're not allowed to fight, they will both suffer. And they say, this year we will have suffer. And then Muharram. So you guys, you can go and kill each other. And then we'll bring Muharram back. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned those people in the Quran, in Surah at tawbah So to play around with the forbidden months is kufr. And to start to play again with them and nasi, to delay them is even more. Well, You're not allowed to fight during those forbidden months. And if you do, they used to call it harb al-fujar, the forbidden wars. And our beloved Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa attended one when he was a young boy. As he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Kuntu Ambul Li Amami. I used to go and bring the arch the, the arrows to my uncles. So when the enemies shoot, he will go and quickly pick them up and give him give it to their to his uncles, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You are allowed to defend. And Quraysh in that position were defending themselves. Now a man from Ahl Nasi, when he heard that Abraha built this church to replace the Kaaba, so people can come and do Hajj and embrace Christianity, he said, what is this? How can you compare Al Kaaba to this church? So he went to the church, beautiful church, and he went in the middle of it, and he did what you would normally naturally do, right in the middle, and he put it on all the walls of that church. Abraha said, who did that? They said to him, a man from Ahl Nasi. Who is Ahl Nasi? A religious people from Al-Kaaba. What is the Kaaba? Kaaba is the 
house of Allah that all the Arabs go to for Hajj. He said, that's why they are not coming to my church. What do we do? We destroy Al Kaaba. So he decided to leave with an army heading north. Where to? Al Kaaba, Mecca, Sharafah Allah. Of course, some of the Arab tribes started to mobilize an army to stop him because Al Kaaba is this is something bait Allah. But of course, Abraha was too strong for them. He defeated them all until he reached south of Mecca, Sharaf Allah, a place called At Ta'if. The people of At Ta'if were so scared. They told Abraha, This is not the Kaaba here. It's up, not from here. Now, you need to understand that all the Arabs didn't guard him where the Kaaba is, but the people of At Ta'if did. And actually, one of them said, I'll take you to it, but please don't destroy our city. This man by the name of Zurugal. Zurugal took Abraha to Mecca and the way to Kaaba. Halfway through guarding them, he died. His grave is basically for the Arabs, a grave of a traitor. And his name, if somebody called you, Zurugal, that means you're a traitor. Until today. Well known in their poems, they use the word or the name of Zurugal. And whenever they pass his grave, they will throw his grave with the stones. Anyway, Abraha arrived, and as they were heading down, the people of Mecca had some sheep and camels. The army came, they took everything, including 200 camel and sheep of the leader of Mecca, Sharafah Allah. Who was that? The grandfather of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Abdul Muttalib Ibn Hashim. Abraha set up his tent, started to prepare his army, surround the Kaaba. Abdul Muttalib now wanted to have an audience with him. There's two narration. One is he was called by Abraha himself. Another, somebody facilitated Abdul Muttalib to go and talk to him. Now the Abyssinians, the Arabs in general, no one respected them. Everyone during that time, and even during the time of Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu ardah, when Khalid took his armies to the Romans and Sa'ad took his armies to the Persians, they thought that these people are destitute. Why are you coming here? You're a hungry people. We'll give you 10 riyal. Go back and next year we'll send you some food and clothes. Go back. So Arabia in general were basically, yeah, we say in Arabic, hamaj, like animals, as we've seen. So the Abyssinia looked down on the Arabs. And for Abdul Muttalib to come and have an audience with the general and the governor of Yemen, Abraha, this is an insult. But he allowed it. Abdul Muttalib came in. Abdul Muttalib was a tall man a handsome and a good-looking man. When Abraha saw him, he had his seat, big throne, and normally you would be sitting in front. So when he saw Abdul Muttalib coming in, sort of, he had haiba, fear when he, when he looks at you. So he respected him. So he left his throne and he came and sat on the floor next to Abdul Muttalib as sign of respect. You are the head of Quraysh? Yes. Yes, you asked for, for me. Do you want to see me? He said, yes. What do you want? He said, your soldiers took 200 of my camels and sheep. I want them back. Abraha looked at him and he said, when I saw you, I respected you. And when you talk to me, and instead of begging me not to destroy the house of your God, you're telling me, please give me my 200 sheep and camels? He said, 
Ya Abraham, I am the Lord of these camels. As for the Kaaba, فَإِنَّ لَهَا رَبٌ يَحْمِيهِ This house has its own Lord. It will protect it. I want my own. أَنَا رَبِّ الْإِبِلِ Rabb here means the owner of. Rabb al-Bayt, the father. Ana Rabb al-Ibl. I'm the owner of this. He said yes. We are not here to harm anyone. We are here for one reason. To bring down that house. He said, you do whatever you want. And he left. He went to Quraysh and he said, all of you out. Leave the space for him. They did. Abraha started to take his army and they had elephant. An elephant was like a tank during that time. Tool of war. Horses, camels run away from the front of it. So it was, and elephants normally go through a training process. And the trainer of these elephants, high rank in the army, we will see that if we have a chance to talk about the Persians and Al Qadisiya with Sa'd ibn Abi Waqas radiallahu anhu arda. The elephant started to head down to the Kaaba. As it gets closer, the elephant sat down. And the trainer around the elephant, trying to pull it, come on, move. The elephant sat. Stand up again, take it back, goes backward, try to go forward, stops and sit. More than once they tried to get the elephants forward and all of a sudden they looked and the sky was black. Birds, little bird, asafir. Each bird has a stone one in the mouth and one in each of their leg, feet. They flow over that army. This little stone, some scholars said, as big as the lintel. You know the lintel? Atz, habbat al atz, or as big as the beans, full falafel. You know the little bean. It's not big, very, very small. And the birds themselves are very small birds. Flow over that huge army and they started to throw these little stones, touches the body, melt the person, dies. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us about this in very famous Surah, Surah Al-Fil. Birds, وَمَا يَعْلَمْ جُنُودَ رَبِّكَ إِلَّا هُو came on top of Abraha and his army. Abraha himself was killed and the army, of course, destroyed. The Arabs, Abdul Muttalib and Quraysh, glorified the house even more. This year, because the Arabs didn't have any sort of math or knowledge of anything around them, they used to call the years with the major event. So they will say, this is the year of the elephant. The year of the elephant was the birth of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Five months, six months after the year of the elephant, our beloved Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was born. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu arda, two years younger than him. So two years after the year of the elephant. Khadija radiallahu anha, 15 years. Older than him. 15 years before 
the year of the elephant. Osman, five years older than him, uh, younger than him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So it's, and this is how the Arabs used to, until of course Omar radiallahu anhu arda came in and he started to ad introduce the administrator or administering the empire. And we start to have our own, of course, calendar, math, and the systems that he put together. But during that time, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was born. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam coming from a clan, I'm not sure if you can see the map. From the top, we called him Quraysh. This is the known name, but actually the name is Fihr. Quraysh comes from Qirsh, it's to do with business because the, most of them are business people. Fihr had three children. The most important for us is Lu'ay. Lu'ay, the most important for us is Kaab. Kaab and Murrah is important and Qusay. Qusay is very important figure because here Qusay, they call him al Mujamma'. And the reason for that is, if you remember with me, Jurhum was in control until Khuza'a came. Qusay managed to bring all the tribe against Khuza'a and he controlled Mecca and with it al Kaaba, And with it Al-Siqaya, Al-Rifada, Umur Al-Hajj. And he built what we call Dar al-Nadwa. We will hear about Dar al-Nadwa many times. Dar al-Nadwa is more like a simply hall where the heads of Quraysh will have their meetings. And one of those crucial meetings they had when they decided to kill Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam migrating from Mecca to Medina before he migrated. So Qusay is a major figure for us. Qusay had four children. The most important for us is basically Abd Manaf. Abd Manaf gave four children. The most important is Hashim. Well, Hashim is the grand grandfather of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And then we have Abdul Muttalib. Abdul Muttalib, basically, his name is not Abdul Muttalib. His name is Shayba. But when his father married his mother, he left him in Medina and he grew up. When he grew up, his uncle Al Muttalib went to Medina to bring him back. No one in Mecca saw Shayba before. And when Al Muttalib came, Shayba was riding behind him on a donkey. And as I said before, during that time you can go shopping, you can buy slaves. You stopped in the market and I'm gonna get one and you come. So they saw who? They saw Shayba riding behind Al Muttalib. So they said, oh, Al Muttalib got a slave, Abdul Muttalib. He said, no, 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 this is my brother's, I'm his uncle, this is my brother's son. His name is Shayba, but people nicknamed him Abdul Muttalib. Even Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa never called him Shayba. He will call him Abdul Muttalib. Abdul Muttalib had all these children. Abu Talib, which is the same mother of Abdullah. This is important because Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa will end up in the house of Abu Talib to be looked after. Al-Abbas wa Hamza radiallahu anhum wa ardahum. Al-Abbas is very much the same year that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa was born. Hamza radiallahu anhu, Asad Allah, Sayyid al-Shuhada wa Amm al-Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Well, Abbas, this were the only two who came to Islam. The rest, and I'm sure you would know Abdul Uzza, who is named Abu Lahab. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala called him in the Quran, Tabbat Yada Abi Lahab, that's him. 
Abdullah is the father of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Al-Haris is very important for us as well. And the reason for that is, if you remember with me, when Jurhum were defeated, they wiped out Zamzam. And no one knew where Zamzam was until Abdul Muttalib time. He had a dream, three consecutive nights. Every night in one of these dream, he will be told where to go to find Zamzam. And the third day, he basically get to know where Zamzam was. And he asked his only son, Al-Haris, he said, come with me, bring your sword, and I'm going to dig. If Quraysh comes, make sure you keep them busy until I finish what I need to finish. Quraysh saw Abdul Muttalib digging between two of their idols. How, how dare you do this? Al-Haris with his sword stopped them, pushed them back. Abdul Muttalib kept digging until he said, Allahu Akbar. And now when he found the top of Zamzam and he took it out and Zamzam basically rebirth again. Here Abdul Muttalib made an oath. Wallahi, if I have 10 children, I will slaughter one of them. Because he had only one during that time and Allah gave him more than 10. So he decided to slaughter one of them. So he told his sons about his oath. They all came to him around the Kaaba and he said, I'm going to put the dots. You know the cup and what's your name? And Haris, what's your name? And he put it in a cup and run. Abdullah came out. Abdullah who was the youngest and he loved him. They did it again, Abdullah. Third time, Abdullah, that's it. Abdullah, Abdullah submitted to his father and Abdul Muttalib started to kill Abdullah. Quraysh, of course, was furious. How can you do this? They stopped him. As they were basically struggling with him, Abdullah got hit in the head. His nickname, Abdullah al-Ashaj, the one who had a hit in the head. Stop it, Ya Abdul Muttalib. If you do this, it's going to be a ritual. Everyone will do it. What do we do? Let's go to Al Kahina, one of the priests in Jahiliya. They decided to do so. And this Kahina said, What's the diya for you? He said, 10 camels. He said, All right, get the cup again and put Abdullah and Nadiya on the other side. We'll see which one will come first. Oh, Abdullah, put another 10 camels. Abdullah, 10 camels, until it came 100 camels. And Abdullah was free. The hadith, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa is sahih. Ana ibn Zabihain. I am the son of the two who were to be slaughtered. Ismail alayhi salam, remember Ismail alayhi salatu wa salam. And now his father, Abdullah, but he was saved. Abdullah, Abu Nabi, salawatu rabbi wa salamuhu alayhi. And then we have Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Al-Mustafa Abu Qasim. His nickname, Abu Qasim. He had two boys. He will have Ibrahim later. Alayhi salam. He will have Al-Qasim wa Abdullah. Abdullah could be Al-Tahir wa Tayyib. He had three names. Abdullah, Al-Tahir wa Tayyib. But it's just the one. Al-Qasim died before Islam. Abdullah died just at the beginning of Islam. So they were both of them children. Alayhim salam He had four daughters. Zainab radiallahu anha wa ardaha. Ruqayya radiallahu anha wa ardaha. Umm Kulsum radiallahu anha wa ardaha. Wa Fatima radiallahu anha wa ardaha. Later on in Medina, he will have Ibrahim. And this is what we call Ala Bayt al Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Ali Muhammad wa barik ala Muhammad wa ala Ali Muhammad. 
alayhim afdalu salati wa taslim. And with them, we have Ummahat al Mu'mineen and the children of Al Abbas wa Aqil as well, according to the ulama. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was born in the year when Abraha came to destroy Al Kaaba. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala selected Ismail from the sons of Ibrahim. And he selected Kanana from the son of Ismail. And Quraysh from Kanana. And Hashim from Quraysh. And he selected me from Bani Hashim. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam from an honorable tree back to our father Ibrahim Ismail Ibn Ibrahim alayhim wa ala nabiyyina Muhammad afdalus salati wa taslim wa Hashim his real name Amr Hashim his real name Amr they called him Hashim because he was so generous that man that he will bring the food and the bread break the bread and gave it to Al-Hajjaj, the Hujjaj, Baytullah Al-Haram. So Hashim, min Tahshim, when you, when you break things. And the name stuck. So again, you've got another name to the clans of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, wa huwa Al-Jid Al-A'zam. Wa Abdul Manaf, his name, Al-Mughira. So SubhanAllah, I mean, who knows a Sahabi by the name of Abdullah ibn Uthman? Who knows Abu Bakr Siddiq? This is the whole thing, isn't it? So the Arabs have these nicknames that makes you confused, but at the same time, that's the tribal thing. So Abu Bakr is Abdullah ibn Uthman. Abu Huraira, Abdullah ibn Sakhr, Allahu Akbar. So the names can be a little bit challenging for you. So, Manaf al Mughira, and they used to say that his face was like moon, and moon for the Arab is the most beautiful things. Qusay, his name was Zayd. So, why did they call him Qusay? Qusay is Wajaa min Aqsa al Madina Rajulun Yasa, Jaa min Aqsa al Madina, from far. Qusay far means far place. His mother from Bilad al-Sham. And he lived with them in his young ages. And then they brought him back. That's why they called him Qusay. Because he was away. He was far from basically the rest of his brothers. So these are just some of the names that you have in front of you. Abdul Shams, of course, will be um, a crucial for us as well. This is where the clans of Banu Umayyah and Osman ibn Affan radiallahu anhum wardahum ajma'in. Abdul Muttalib had children, female children, Umul Hakam, wa Atika, wa Barra, wa Safiya, wa Urwa, wa Umayma. And as we said, he had Hamza, wa Abbas that came to Islam and the rest of course we don't have much of a news about them they didn't come to Islam some died before Islam and some refused Islam like Abu Lahab who became arch enemy of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam we did talk about Zamzam and the slaughter of Abdullah al-Ashaj and how Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said about himself, Ana ibn Zabihain, until we have the two, the parents of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Abdullah ibn Abdul Muttalib al-Hashimi, wa Amina bin Tuwahb. If I go back to this tree, one thing as well I'd like to um, to mention, and that is Al Khulafa al Rashidin, Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu wa ardah from Bani Taym, so he's from Quraysh. Wa Umar ibn al Khattab radiallahu anhu wa ardah from Bani Adi. 
wa Usman ibn Affan radiyallahu anhu wa arda from Bani Umayyah Abdi Shams wa Ali ibn Abi Talib radiyallahu anhu wa arda from the clan of Abdul Muttalib these are the four guarded Khalifa they are all from the honorable tree of Quraysh our mother Khadija radiyallahu anha wa ardaha bint Abdul Uzza from the clans of Quraysh as well radiyallahu anhum wa ardahum ajma'in so this is a just a, a mention quickly to the four guarded who took over from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam so Abdullah the father of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was a young man he married Amina bint Wahb al Qurashiyya. She is actually from Medina, Bani Najjar. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when we arrive in Medina, when he migrate from Mecca to Medina, he will stay the first few months in Bani in Najjar. Bani Najjar, relation to his mother, Amina. He married at a young age, Abdullah, and he was a businessman. The ila fi Quraysh, ila fihim rihlat al shita was safe. Most of them were business men. Abdullah went as many of his um, Quraysh men to Bilad al-Sham for business. In the way back he died. Amina was pregnant with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That basically left Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam without a father. Alam yajidika yateeman so he came to this world Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam And he didn't have a father And he will live only six years with his mother So he will lose the mother and the father By the age of six Salawatu Rabbi wa salamuhu alayhi And he will have to move From his father, mother's house To his grandfather Two years And then he will move again to his uncle Until the age of 25 so if we have a look at the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and how he reached to the age of 25, from year one to year four, he stayed with his mother. But actually most of the time, as we will see inshallah next week, he will be with Halima Saadiyya from Bani Saad. She is his wet mothers. Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam will have about three wet mothers one of them which is the most important Halima Saadiyya some said she became Muslim Alhamdulillah depends on the book that you read Allahu A'lam after four years he went back and he lived with his mother Amina bint Wahb she died and he was six years of age Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and then he left the house of his mother to go with his grandfather Abdul Muttalib the ruler of Mecca and the head of Quraysh, Abdul Muttalib loved Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And two years in his house, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his grandfather died and he had to move to his, the house of Abu Talib. Abu Talib was not a well-to-do man. He was not a rich man. So from eight, about 11, 12 years of age, he started to go out and work. He had to earn living. He worked as a shepherd, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So he had a very harsh life right from the beginning until the age of 25 where he met Umm al muminin our mother Khadija bint Khuwailid bint Abdul Uzza radiyallahu anha wa ardaha a well-to-do woman, very rich, beautiful, and she knew how to read and write. Arabia, rarely that you see men knew how to read and write. For a woman to read and write, this is something, of course, special. Rich, beautiful, and from an honorable family. To marry who? A businessman? He's not even a businessman. But his life changed. 
his life changed. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Inshallah, next week, we'll have a look at the birth of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the miracles that came with it. And we'll have a look at his early years with Bani Sa'd, Halima Sa'diyya, radiallahu anha, and the event of the opening of the chest. And this will happen twice, at the age of four and at the age of 50 before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala take him to the extraordinary trip to Al-Isra al-Mi'raj. Again, that will happen. And then we'll see what sort of values he got, sallallahu alayhi wa from his grandfather, being the leader of Quraysh, in a position of the governing body, if you like, and Abu Talib. And Abu Talib will stay with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa till the age of 50. Yes, he will leave him and move into the rich quarter of Mecca with his wife Khadija, but Abu Talib will always be a father figure to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa He didn't have a father. So Abu Talib was the man that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa grew up with and loved and respected. Abu Talib ibn Abdul Muttalib. And then we will see him as a teenager. What did he do? as a teenager, sallallahu alayhi wa and his business trips, and how he get to marry our mother Khadija radiallahu anha, and then we'll have a look at the household of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa who he didn't have, only his children, he had Umm Ayman and Ali radiallahu an, and Zaid ibn Harisa radiallahu anhum ardahum ajma'in. How did that all happen? Where did they end up why did they end up in the house of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Wa sallallahu ala nabina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. If you have a questions.